Theater 5, show number 38, We Are All Alone. The opening teaser runs two minutes, five seconds. Ends with theme up to conclusion. There's a two-second break here for the first commercial. The first act runs seven minutes, ten seconds. Ends with a cue, please stand by, followed by a music curtain. A two-second pause here for commercials two and three. The second act runs 9 minutes 47 seconds, ends with a cue, Let Us Give Thanks, followed by a music curtain. A two-second pause here for commercial number four. The closing follows and contains full credits. The show feed will begin five seconds from now. Do you believe what we heard is some kind of message from space? Yes, I do. Well, suppose, suppose the message wasn't sent by an alien civilization. What if something else is trying to speak to us? Something else? Do you mean some kind of super intelligence, some supreme being? Yes. Then in that case, I sincerely hope we can understand what the message is before it's too late. <laughs> Theater 5 presents We Are All Alone. Ladies and gentlemen, please pardon the noise and confusion here, but this is an extraordinary event, and we're broadcasting under extraordinary conditions. This is Gary Benton at Stellar Observatory. Less than one hour ago, astronomers here, operating the planet's largest radio telescope, reported the reception of some sort of message from what seems to be outer space. It sounds much like static. But the significant thing is that the pattern keeps repeating itself. Now, according to Dr. Forrest, head of the observatory, this means that an intelligent source is sending it. Dr. Forrest is here at the scene of this excitement, and I'm trying to get his attention. Dr. Forrest! Dr. Sir! Dr. Forrest! Dr. Forrest, do you think we've heard from another planet? Well, I I don't know, but we're certainly hearing from somebody or something intelligent. I see. Then you believe there are other civilizations in the universe besides our own? quite definitely. As any physicist will tell you, there are countless billions of suns, many of them with, with planet systems around them. Oh, yes. There's someone out there, all right. And they're waiting for us. Waiting and perhaps calling from somewhere in outer space. Theater 5 is presenting the radio drama, We Are All Alone. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gary Benton again, coming to you from Stellar Observatory, where something really fantastic has occurred in the past hour. We just spoke with Dr. Forrest, head of the observatory, and as soon as possible, we will broadcast a tape of the noise pattern which has come from outer space. Please stand by for further details. We are now switching back to your local station. So much for that. Until things start popping again. Hey, who's got a match? Benton, telephone for you. Oh, thanks. All right, coming. Thank you. Hello? Gary? This is Ray at the studio. What's going on up there? Plenty, Ray. The boys up here think they've hit the jackpot this time. They claim it has to be something intelligent that's sending that noise. Well, why is that? Because the same pattern keeps coming in. They never heard anything like it. Can it be just coincidence? Not a chance, no. Look, they had a computer figure it out. Uh-huh. After the sixth repetition, the chances of a seventh are astronomical. More than ten is just about impossible, and this thing's been going on for an hour. Well, all right, but I got troubles down here. Linda Maxwell wants to go on with her show. Uh Uh-oh. She says that her listeners aren't interested in space. They just want to hear her. Is she kidding? This may be the biggest thing that's ever happened to us. This thing's so hot, the president of the planet has a direct line to this place. Look, I, I... Ray, I think you should just play music and hold everything open for what happens here. Suppose nothing happens. It will, it will. They're going to give me a tape recording of the sound to play on the air. Why why don't you have Linda stand by just in case, huh? Okay, I'll tell her. Yeah, and give her my love, huh? Yeah, right, right. Talk to you later. Now for the fight. Linda! 
Lynn, I just spoke with Gary Benton up at the observatory. Ah, yes, the talented Mr. Benton. And what words of wisdom does he have for me now? Well, hmm? Gary says that things are popping up there. He's going to get a tape to play very soon. What about my listeners? Well, this is a news special, you know. And it just might be the most important event ever. Oh, I know it, Ray. And I suppose I can't really argue the point. It's just that... Well, you know how I hate to let that inflated ego of Gary's get any bigger than it is already. <laughs> you know, I believe you and Gary must be secretly married, the way you two go around throwing barbs at each other. <laughs> uh-uh, not a chance, Ray. We're both much too smart for anything like that. A meaning that you'll wait until he asks you. Well, maybe. So why don't you just wait in the studio? Gary wants you to stand by in case something goes wrong. Oh, hey, I have a better idea. Suppose I go up to the observatory and split the news with Gary. That way my listeners could hear me, and then everybody's happy. That's hmm? not a bad idea. Besides, it may be good to get a woman's viewpoint of what's happening. Ray, listen, hmm? uh, do, do you really think there's anything to it? I mean, this message from space? Oh, I don't know. It's possible, all right. But if it is true, then we're not alone anymore. That's right. What about it? Well, it's spooky, that's all. I mean, we've sent satellites into space. We've been sending messages out to the universe for years, but this is different. Somebody's sending us something. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's an answer to one of our messages. But if it is that, it's even more scary. Then whoever it is must be very much like we are. Maybe a whole planet just like us. Well, the universe is big enough for both of us, I suppose. Now, look, how about you getting up to the observatory and start sending us messages? Okay, I'm there already. The next voice you hear will be that of Linda Maxwell from outer space. Well, for Pete's sake, what are you doing up here? Well, maybe Ray wanted somebody with a little human feeling in on a story like this. Very funny. All right, Gary, I'm sorry. Come on, tell me what's going on here. Well, from what I've been able to piece together, there were two men on the telescope when the noise started coming in. Yeah. Dr. Forrest, who's head man, and Professor Sanford, a physicist. They're both tops in their field. Which is? Which is radio astronomy. For several years, they've been sending out signals to all parts of the universe, hoping to contact other civilizations. At the same time, they've been listening to sounds coming in, hoping to hear something intelligible. And tonight they heard. They sure did, baby. Well, where's the tape now? Dr. Forrest has it. He's going to give me first crack at it, to play it on the air. We've got the news beat of the year. Well, what's the noise sound like? It's a little weird, especially when you realize it may mean something. What are you doing now? I'm going to play you a tape of what they usually hear when the telescope is on. Well, how do they get this sound? Well, from what Dr. Forrest tells me, they aim the telescope at a particular area of the sky. Then they tune in on a specific frequency and turn on the radio receiver. And they record whatever they hear. Right. Huh? Here, listen to this. Mm. That's all coming from space? Every bit of it. And the sounds we're hearing? Are the sounds of the universe. Oh, boy. Makes me shiver. Each of those sounds is coming from billions of miles out in space. Some of them have taken uh, thousands, maybe millions of years to get to us. Mr. Benton, Dr. Forrest would like to see you. Thank you. I'll be right back, Linda. I think he wants to give me the tape. Dr. Forrest? Oh, Mr. Benton, come in. I'd like you to meet Professor Sanford. It's an honor, Professor. And for me, Mr. Benton, Dr. Forrest tells me that you've been following the progress of our little adventure almost from the beginning. That's right, sir. <laughs> I must say I admire your patience. Well, stubbornness would be more like it, Professor. I figured if I made a pest of myself long enough, I'd get the inside track on the story, so well, here I am. Now, Mr. Benton, I have the tape that I believe you wish to play for your listeners, uh, the... Uh, president of our planet has already been notified and is being kept informed of developments. Well, sir, have you been able to determine anything definite yet? Well, there's more to be done, of course, but I can say this. Perhaps the most fantastic thing of all is the strength of the radio waves. The strength? Mm -hmm. What Dr. Forrest means is that an unknown radio source far beyond the universe we know is sending us signals on 10,000 megawatts of power. Ten... But that's more power than my whole radio station uses. And that's what the reading is, and there's no mistake. Well, Mr. Benton, suppose you play the tape and we'll get back to work. Yes, well, thank you, Dr. Forrest and Professor Sanford. Linda, Linda, get the engineer to cue up this tape right away. I'm going on the air as soon as he opens my mic, hmm? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gary Benton at Stellar Observatory. We have just received the tape of the sound pattern which has come to us from outer space. 
In just one minute, you will hear what is believed to be the first sounds ever received from an intelligence somewhere in space. Please stand by. Theater 5 is presenting We Are All Alone. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gary Benton at Stellar Observatory. I'm about to play a tape recording for you of the noise pattern that came from outer space earlier this evening. Scientists here at the observatory believe that the pattern is a message and that somewhere far out in the universe, something intelligent is trying to communicate with us. The next sound you hear is coming from outer space. Goose flesh. Why? I don't know. It's just spooky. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just played for you what may be the first message ever received from outer space. Scientists are now determining what that message may be. As reports come in, we will broadcast them, so please stay tuned. Well, that's that, at least for the moment. I hope the president of the planet was listening. Gary? Hmm? Listen, suppose this, uh, whatever it is, isn't friendly. I mean, suppose it wants to destroy us. What then? Well, first it has to get here. If it could send messages, it could get here. Well, it's, it's a little different, Linda. One big difference is that radio waves travel through just about everything. Bodies can't do that, at least not that we know of. But just suppose it did happen. What would you do? My <laughs> love... I'd gather you up in my arms and run as fast as I could. Oh, dear. <laughs> Telephone for Mr. Benton. Oh, thanks. Benton here. This is Ray, Gary. Here at the studio. Yeah, what's up? Oh, boy, things are really popping. We've had about 100 calls already on this message from outer space, and they're coming in faster than we can take them. And I have personally spoken to two men who claim to understand the message. What? You heard me. Both of them claim that they can understand what is being sent, and what's more, they know where it's coming from. One of them fell on his head when he was 12, and ever since then, he's had visions <laughs> of the day when this message would come. Yeah, well, what, what about the other? Well, the other one knows all about the message because it's for him. I see. Well, go yeah, on. It seems that he is uh, not of this planet. He came here many years ago from his home, millions of miles away in another galaxy. Now they want him back. Now, that's what the message is. Telling him to come home. Look, uh, seriously, Gary, I uh, I just wanted to congratulate you on being the first to get this on the air. It's the biggest thing that's ever happened around here. Oh, thanks, Ray. I'll I'll uh, call you later at the studio. You'll be there, huh? Where else? Right. That was Ray. Well, did he say my listeners are storming the building because they can't hear me? Yeah, something like that. I thought so. Hey, here's Doctor Forrest, the professor. Come on, I'll introduce you. Oh, okay. Oh, Mr. Benton. Sir. Well, how did the broadcast go? Just fine, Doctor, just fine. I'll uh, return the tape after I've run it once more. Good. Meanwhile, this charming young thing on my arm is Linda Maxwell. She's my assistant. Mm. Linda, Dr. Forrest, okay. Professor Sanford. How pleasure, Miss Maxwell. Anything new, Doctor? I'm afraid not. We've tried radio telegraphy with no luck. We've just finished running the pattern through the modulating receiver. Oh, what does that do? It breaks down the electromagnetic wave. The wave pattern is carrying the electrical equivalent of sound wave, then the receiver can reproduce the original sound. You mean a voice? If that's the original sound, yes. Well, sir, what were the results of your test? It's definitely not what we expected. I see. Well, if something is being sent out, what, what form would it take? I mean, for example, would it have our alphabet? Hardly. It would probably be a mathematical formula. Equations are constant everywhere in the universe. I yes, see. that's the only common bond there is, of course. You mean everything else, history, culture, is meaningless to an alien civilization? Well, in terms of our experience, I'm afraid so, Miss Maxwell. Well, what do you do now, sir? Well, there's one more experiment Professor Sanford and I want to try. It's a long shot, so I'd better not say anything about it just yet. But we should know the results very soon now. Dr. Forrest. Yes, Miss Maxwell. Suppose... Suppose the message was not sent by an alien civilization. What if something else is trying to speak to us? Something else? 
Do you mean some kind of uh, super intelligence or some supreme being? Yes. Then in that case, Miss Maxwell, I sincerely hope we can understand what the message is before it's too late. Ladies and gentlemen of the news media, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Sanford and I have called all of you here to acquaint you with the test results we mentioned several hours ago. Uh, let me begin by saying that after our initial shock, we noted the rather odd fact that the radio waves were coming in at uh, 82.2 megacycles. Uh, that's the frequency we use for satellite communication. We'd expect radio waves from outer space to come in the more universal 50 megacycle range if they were sent by a living intelligence. Exactly. So we began to suspect that our uh, intelligent sender of messages might be aboard one of our own lost satellites. What? One of our lost satellites? Sir? Yes, Mr. Benton. But how is that possible, sir? I mean, a lost satellite can't just travel billions of miles into space and then suddenly begin sending radio messages back, where would it get the energy? I think I can answer that, Mr. Benton. The satellite could be in a solar orbit that includes a number of planets. A strong magnetic field around these planets would trap enough sun particles to ionize the transmitter. I see, and that would give it the tremendous energy required? Well, it could be as simple as that. To check this theory, we submitted the noise pattern to the decoding scanner. Everything was double-checked. And there's no doubt that the mysterious message from outer space, the, uh, the something that is sending us a repeating pattern, is a transmitter in one of our own satellites. Where it is, we don't know, and we'll never know. Certainly billions of miles away, perhaps in another universe. And I thought this was the story of the century. Oh, but it is, Mr. Benton. Well, how do you mean, sir? From an emotional viewpoint, this is quite naturally a, a shattering disappointment but not from the scientific point of view. This lost satellite is sending us information that will revolutionize our thinking. Already, we know of a planet that has a dead moon near it and a fantastic amount of radioactivity surrounding it. Who knows what else we shall learn? Well, you'll excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. There's much work yet to be done. Professor Sanford. Yes? Professor... Are you going to call the president now, sir? Oh, yes. I'm going to let President Moore know that this is a scientific breakthrough of major importance. Thank you, Professor. Well, Linda, it seems the all-powerful stranger from another planet turns out to be a, a phantom of our own imagination and invention. And we are alone. All alone. No, oh, Linda. Not ever all alone. People of our planet, this is your president speaking. It is with sadness that we acknowledge the continued failure of our efforts to contact other civilizations. For many years, we have listened to the sounds of the universe, hoping to hear alien messages. We must now conclude that we fail because there are no such messages. It appears inescapable that at this moment in the history of the universe, we, the inhabitants of the planet Orbis, one of the two planets around our sun, and one of the countless billions in the Gamma Galaxy are the only intelligent living beings in the vast reaches of space. We should feel both humble and proud. In the limitless universe, only on the planet Orbis are there people who can marvel at the beauty of the sky. The sky that is there just for us. People of Orbis, let us give thanks.
Theater 5 has presented We Are All Alone, written by Shane Stevens and directed by Harry Nelson. In the cast, Nat Poland, Ralph Camargo, Terry Keene, Guy Sorrell, and Frank Thomas. Audio engineer, Marty Folia. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production.